Let me take you back to January 2013. Bruno Mars is top of the Billboard Hot 100 with Locked Out of Heaven. Some diehards are still probably calling memes image macros. And Jonathan Colton is an internet darling thanks to his quirky nerdy music for nerds. But it's not all cake and delicious brains for our boy Johnny C because he's about to have one of his songs stolen by the smash hit TV show Glee. Hi, I'm Mark and I'm taking a break from my usual Dunkin' Donuts rap videos to instead talk about Glee, Jonathan Colton and the Baby Got Back controversy. If you don't know the events surrounding this particular Glee episode and you also weren't on the internet in 2013, then you may not be familiar with all of the factors of our story. But don't be afraid, as someone who was a nerd on the internet in 2013, I am here to educate you. I was like 15 going on 16 when all of this happened, so I hope that emphasizes just how much free time and mental capacity I had to dedicate to things happening on the internet. I spent as little time as I possibly could thinking about school and I was actively using Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, and most of all, Twitter. I've actually stopped using all of those since then, but I've recently restarted using Tumblr. It's been an interesting time. <laughs> the key players in this story, as I mentioned, are the hit Fox TV show Glee and singer-songwriter Jonathan Colton. I assume most people watching this will know what Glee is, so I'll give a little explanation about that in a while, but for the moment I'm going to start talking about who this singer-songwriter guy is. LA face with the Oakland booty Lovingly called Joko by his fans, Jonathan Colton is a musician best known for his often funny but almost always nerdy songs. He gained prominence online through a lot of his independent releases like Code Monkey, Skull Crusher Mountain, and Re Your Brains. Some of these did go genuinely like viral for their time, not that that word really has much meaning anymore. But like this fan made video for Code Monkey was uploaded 16 years ago and has 7 million views. And there are other similar videos for some other songs of his, each with views in the millions, which is a lot for the time. The user base was a lot smaller. Back Back then. Also, I just love how much that video is representative of like a certain part of the internet in the mid to late 2000s. If you could distill my idea for a 2006 internet video, it would be a crisp 480p music video made in World of Warcraft for a Jonathan Colton song. I'm actually surprised that the quality is as high as 480p to be honest. 244p gang, rise up! Thanks to this niche popularity he was gaining, Joko began touring the US, including making his way from the East Coast across the country to Seattle. It was after one of these Seattle shows that he was approached by a game studio who asked if he would be interested in making music for one of their upcoming games. And if you didn't recognize any of the songs that I mentioned earlier, there's a good chance that you might recognize this one. This was a triumph. Yes, Jonathan Colton was the guy who wrote Still Alive and Want You Gone, both of the ending songs from the Portal games. If the song Still Alive and the term The Cake Is A Lie mean nothing to you, then you and I had very different upbringings. So yeah, Joko didn't do too badly for himself, and he's even gone on to carve out a niche but sizable fandom. Like, this guy runs a big nerd cruise every year, and they rent out an entire cruise ship for it these days. He's got influence. And he was even nominated for a Tony Award for his work on the Spongebob musical. He's continued to release music as well, including his 2017 album Solid State, of which I have a signed frame copy on my wall and a tattoo on my arm. But a lot of those songs for which he originally gained notoriety were written as part of a musical project called Thing A Week. Describing Thing A Week on his blog, Joko said, From September 2005 to September 2006, I recorded a new song every week and released it for free on my website as a podcast. It was an attempt to keep the creative juices flowing as freely as possible and a way for me to push myself to take risks, work quickly and trust in the creative process. It was also a stunt designed to get people to notice me. It worked, suckers. Sometimes the songs were written and recorded in a week and other times they were covers of other people's songs. If you couldn't tell, that second part will be relevant. And apart from being a very impressive feat and a great utilization of creative commons, in hindsight it just seems like a genius idea and I'm not surprised that he found so much success from it. And the first big success he saw came in the fifth week on October 14th, 2009 when he posted a cover of Sir Mix-a-Lot's 1992 song, 
Baby Got Back. Joko's entire blog is actually archived on the website that he still uses today, and so you can go back and look at all of the original posts from when he began Thing A Week. To pick kind of a random metric, the song that has the most comments on it before Baby Got Back has 30 as of this recording. The post for Baby Got Back has 270. He also says in a later post that his website received 15,000 unique visitors in the days after he posted the cover, and that the MP3 itself had 47,000 hits, which is a word that I haven't heard used in that context I think in a very long time. I presume he just means downloads. I can imagine that this was a lot of attention to receive as someone who had just quit his day job to start pursuing music full time, and you can see that he made a few posts on his blog in the following week talking about it. This is an aside, but I also thought it was funny that in 2005 in the original post for Baby Got Back, Colton wrote, in the proud tradition of many white Americans who came before me, I hereby steal and whiteify this thick and juicy piece of black culture. It wasn't until week 29 in April 2006 when A Thing A Week song had anywhere near the same success that Baby Got Back did. This came from the original song Code Monkey. But despite the success of that song, it was probably never as out of the blue as Baby Got Back. And like I said, Jonathan Colton would go on to have more success as a musician in the years to come, and he had gained a fair bit of at least internet notoriety by 2013 when he came into contact with Glee. LA face with the Oakland booty. Created in 2009 by Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, and Ian Brennan, Glee really was a smash hit show that ran for six seasons on Fox. I, I have to clarify right off the bat, I was never a Glee fan, and in fact when I was a teenager I definitely thought that I was like too cool for it. I was into real music, like indie folk singer-songwriter Josh Ritter. Yeah, that's the kind of music I was listening to when I was 15. Actually, I didn't realize this when I was writing the script, but I also have, in this case, two signed Josh Ritter albums on my walls and a Josh Ritter tattoo, just like with Jonathan Colton. Uh, this one here uh, is a Josh Ritter tattoo. And because I was never into Glee myself, I really didn't get how big it was until more recently. But like, this show is huge. Not only did it have six successful seasons, though some more successful than others to be fair, it also had its own spin-off reality show called The Glee Project, centered around getting a role on Glee. And a live 41 show transatlantic concert tour where the actors performed songs as their characters, which actually, fun fact, had its last show in Ireland. Suffice to say, it was very popular and very successful. And all three of its creators would go on to be involved in multiple very successful TV shows, especially Ryan Murphy. If you don't think or just don't know if you've seen a Ryan Murphy TV show, there is a very good chance that you have. As for Glee, it centred around the most unhinged teacher in the universe and his high school Glee club. Yeah, even though I wasn't a fan of Glee, I of course know about the ridiculous caricature of a man that is Will Schuster. I had actually thought about making this video a while ago, but the thing that reminded me to do it was watching Mike's Mike's Glee recap series, which really did open my eyes to how massive the show actually was, and also how ridiculous it can be, and also just how weird Mr. Shu is. He plants weed in a kid's locker to force him to join the Glee Club in the first episode. What are you doing, sir? But anyway, this man's crimes are not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the season four episode of Glee titled Sadie Hawkins. Baby got ballet dance with the open now you might think that with an episode title like that, a Sadie Hawkins dance would be relevant to our story. And while it's definitely a factor in the episode, we're not going to be concerning ourselves with it at all. Because at this stage in the show, we have two different locations for storylines, with some characters still in William McKinley High School in Ohio, and others in New York City. And it's here in New York where Kurt, played by Chris Colfer, who I learned by the way won a Golden Globe in 2011 for his work on Glee, 
see. Again, I'm learning a lot as I go here, and this is absolutely a tangent, but I did not realize the Glee was like a Golden Globe winning kind of show. Definitely not meant as an insult, by the way. I mean, I'm a guy whose favorite media is almost always genre fiction, which also doesn't do well at mainstream awards. I just didn't expect this for whatever reason. Anyway, Kurt is thinking about joining the show choir in the New York Academy of the Dramatic Arts, who are called Adam's Apples. His friend Rachel, played of course by Leah Michelle, tells him that it would be a bad idea socially and for his career, but Kurt is still intrigued. So when Kurt runs into Adam, you know, the one with the apples. He tries to entice Kurt into joining with a slowed down version of Sir mix -a -Lot's Baby Got Back. Now at this stage you might be thinking, okay, so they did a slowed down version of Baby Got Back and so did John Bolton, but no one owns slowed down covers. And first of all, I would say his name is Jonathan Colton, get it right. But also, you're correct. Joko doesn't own the rights to slow down covers of Baby Got Back. On top of that, there were a lot of discussions and questions at the time about where this stood legally, and Fox weren't doing anything illegal. At least not in this particular case, I don't trust any of those big corporations to not be doing illegal stuff constantly. But them not having done something illegal is not a defense against them stealing the song from Jonathan Colton because they did steal the song from Jonathan Colton. Before I go on, let's take a listen to both versions to compare them. I probably won't play like a whole lot of clips from any of the three versions of the songs actually, so as not to anger the algorithm gods, but they are all available on YouTube and Spotify if you want to hear more. Speaking of the algorithm gods, if you made it this far, feel free to leave a comment for me and, and give it an old thumbs up. It really helps. <laughs> anyway, here are the Glee and Jonathan Colton versions. I like big butts and I cannot lie You other brothers can't deny When a girl walks in with a nitty bitty waist And a round thing in your face You get sprung So, very similar in style and there are more specific similarities to go into. In fact, there are moments in the Glee version that we can directly point at to show that whoever took the song for the show knew exactly what they were doing when they used it. This wasn't just a coincidence. I mean, first of all, the original is a rap song without a particularly strong melody, while the Glee version and the Joko version have very similar melodies. Actually, if you were to point out any differences between the Glee and the Joko versions, I feel like it's more just flair from the the singers as opposed to actual written differences. So I think it's unlikely that Glee just happened to write the same melody that Joko did. But even if they were just inspired by it, they wouldn't keep a line that Jonathan Colton changed for his version, right? Like they would use all the original lyrics and then make any changes necessary for their version as it's relevant to the show. Right? Well, I think that the most heinous thing that Glee did was keeping this line. In the original Sir mix -a -Lot version, there's a line that goes, I want them real thick and juicy, so find that juicy double. mix -a -Lot's in trouble. I just want to clarify here, he is in trouble because of how horny he is. He's basically doing the, like, Casey Frey, like, you go make me act up thing. <laughs> and in Jonathan Colton's version, he changed that to Johnny C's in trouble, which makes sense because he's Johnny C. But in the Glee version, they didn't change it for the person who's singing. You might be thinking right now, oh, so they didn't change it, so they must have used the original lyrics, so they still sang mix a lots in trouble. No. No, they didn't. They kept the line, Johnny C's in trouble. This character's name is Adam. Who the f is Johnny C? I remember when I first heard that they had kept that in, and my main question was just why? Why would you keep such a blatantly obvious piece of evidence that you took this from another artist, an independent artist? If you wanted to have even a modicum of plausible deniability that you didn't rip this off, then you wouldn't keep it. So the only plausible answer to me is that they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to pretend that they didn't steal it. They knew that they did and they didn't care. And that sucks. I don't want to like rag on Glee as a show or the people who made it. But this is just such an obvious case of people in a position of power at a billion dollar corporation like Fox not caring about a small artist. According to his blog, the producers of Glee would later tell Colton that he should be happy for the exposure. But it's not exposure. 
they didn't credit him. Maybe you might spin the Johnny C line as an homage or even a credit, but I would disagree. Back when this happened, there was a little talk from Jonathan Colton himself about possible legal action. This was reported on in multiple articles, which I'll have linked in the description. There was the issue here of Glee's version using an original melody composed by Colton for his cover that didn't come from the Sir Mix-a-Lot version. And Joko was also questioning whether the Glee version actually used some of the exact audio from his cover. This included some of the instrumentals like the banjo part, as well as a quack sound effect, which I actually also used earlier to censor my use of the word f as far as I can tell, nothing ever came of this legally, and Joko never even got an apology from anyone involved with Glee. In one of his blog posts on the issue, Jonathan Colton said, While they appear not to be legally obligated to do any of these things, they did not apologize, offer to credit me, or offer to pay me, and indicated that this was their general policy in regards to covers of covers. And this is the crux of the story for me. It's not really about the legality. A BuzzFeed article written at the time talked about how Fox owed Joko nothing because there was no infringement on copyright law. And obviously Fox's legal team knew what they were doing and would have known that they were well within their rights to cover a cover without attribution. But just because that's all legally above board doesn't make it okay. And I'll freely admit that I'm biased as a Jonathan Colton fan who never watched Glee, but it feels pretty cut and dry to me that if you're a TV network with a very popular show that according to the Hollywood reporter had a budget of three million dollars per episode, you could literally at the very least contact the independent musician whose work you're heavily lifting from to let them know that you're doing it. The point of this video is more to tell the story than like to make a judgement, but if you look at this situation like an argument, obviously I do fall on one side of it. But there is a little more to tell with this story because there were a few interesting developments after the episode aired. First of all, four days after the Sadie Hawkins episode aired, Jonathan Colton decided to re-release his version of the song titled Baby Got Back in the Style of Glee. He initially released this as a charity single and ended up raising $10,000 split 50-50 between two charities. The first charity was Save the Music Foundation, who at the time were called the VH1 Save the Music Foundation, and who, according to their website, deliver equitable access to music education for millions of students nationwide. I'm presuming the nation is the United States, and it is pretty wide to be fair. And the other charity was It Gets Better, whose mission is to uplift, empower, and connect lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth around the globe. I think this was a great way for Joko to positively channel his energy during what he called on his blog a very stressful time. And it was probably pretty satisfying to see that apparently in the iTunes and Amazon on charts, his single was outperforming Glee's version of Baby Got Back. He also mentioned when he launched the charity single that it would have been a great chance for Fox to promote his music or even match donations. But probably unsurprisingly at this stage, by the way that he writes about the charity single later that year on his blog, it seems like Fox never even acknowledged it. But that wasn't the goal because as he said himself that regardless of whether the single had made anyone at Fox publicly acknowledge the situation, we will create some real-world impact by raising a lot of money for two great causes that are directly related to the Glee brand. There's your win-win. The second result of this whole situation came a year later in January 2014 with the release of an episode of The Good Wife called Goliath and David. So The Good Wife is another show that I've never watched, but long story short, it's a legal drama. And this episode features a copyright infringement case between a band and a TV network over a music show using a song which was a cover of the band's cover. Some small things were changed, but this episode was based on the Baby Got Back situation. What I I did find interesting about this episode is that they also didn't approach Jonathan Colton beforehand to let him know they were doing it. And I mean, it's a story inspired by real events that just happened to involve him, which is a little more far removed than covering his cover of a song. So I wouldn't expect them to need to contact him from a legal standpoint, but if it were me, it's I... It's not. It's not you, though. 
Okay, but if it were me, I probably would have given him like at least a heads up just after seeing what had happened in the actual real life events that the story was based on. That being said, after the episode aired, Jonathan Colton was invited to make a cameo appearance on The Good Wife, which he did, playing a drunk driver in the first episode of season 6. And he even ended up working closely with the creators of The Good Wife, contributing music to multiple animated shorts for their spin-off show The Good Fight. So those are two examples of what I would say are positive results for Jonathan Colton from a situation that was mostly definitely not positive. But, I hear you ask, where are they now? Well, as I said, on top of many other credits, Jonathan Colton has continued releasing music, including his album Solid State in 2017 and his album Some Guys in 2019. I do love both of those albums, but they're wildly different. As for Glee, it ended its almost six-year run in 2015, so who's laughing now? Yeah, Joko's out here eating good, and where is Glee? Dead. Dead in a fucking ditch like it deserves- Okay, no. So obviously Glee is a show, and shows that aren't Grey's Anatomy do have to end eventually. And with the built-in difficulty of a high school show continuing the story after the original cast has graduated, as well as the hurdle of losing one of your main cast members to a tragic early death, six seasons is fairly admirable. The creators of the show have all gone on to have successful careers, and Glee itself lives on as a mostly well-remembered and definitely often memed culture cultural touchstone of the 2010s. As for this controversy, I, I feel like it's mostly been forgotten, but I do think it's an interesting piece of pop culture history, which is why I wanted to make a video about it. A video which you hopefully enjoyed. If you want to watch any more of my videos, please feel free to check out the channel, though I can't promise that any of them have a similar topic to this one, because as of recording this, none of them do. I can promise, though, that they'll all have me in them, so I can totally understand if, if you don't want to watch them. I mentioned earlier that Mike's Mike's Glee videos kind of reinvigorated me to make this video, and this style of like pop culture or internet history video is something that I really like watching on YouTube myself. This was definitely influenced by other bigger channels like Izzy's for example, who if you haven't watched already I would highly recommend. I actually wore their merch for this, this is an Izzy's merch sweatshirt, it's the edgy cat sweatshirt that says cringe but free, which is me, because I'm old and cringe now so I I may as well embrace it. Anyway, this was a fun video to make between bigger projects, so now I'm gonna stop procrastinating and start the long process of making a video all about season two of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And last but not least, thank you so much for watching.